I, I want to continue with, with what I was sharing last week on the word of God. And, and this time I go to a word that Jesus taught. Uh, we call it the parable of the sower. Because he taught about sowing seed. And the scripture that I want to speak from is in Matthew chapter 13. And I start in verse 3, but it's, it's a long scripture, so I won't read it all. I'll just read little extracts from it. Because I'm taking it from Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 to 23. Verse 3. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Let me stop there. There are two ways in which a person can sow seed into the soil. You can plant seed. In which case, when you plant seed, you know the type of soil that it requires and you plant the seed deliberately with precision into the soil and it will flourish if it is nurtured with the water and the nutrients that it needs. A word from God is like a seed. Jesus likened the word to a seed. A word from God is like a seed. When a seed is planted in your heart, it is as if there's a word that was sent specially for you. Amen? It's not like the word that comes generally and you catch it and pick that which belongs to you but a, a, a planting of a seed in your heart is when God speaks a word for you. Amen. Planted words come in a more intimate environment than in a setting like this. A, a planted word can come in a setting like this, but it is more likely to come when you are in well, when first of all you are a believer, amen, it's more likely to come to a believer and it's more likely to come either in a place of study, in a place of meditation, in a place of prayer, a planted word can come. Amen. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That is to say that there is always a word that is flowing from the mouth of God. God doesn't stop speaking. Amen. He also said, as he taught us the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. So we need to we need a planted word every day. Amen. And then there's the scattered seed. The sower, in the case of this parable, went to sow, had the seed in his hand, and was scattering. When you scatter seed, you cannot determine or you cannot predetermine what soil it will fall into. So the scattered seed is a lot like a sermon. The word is going forth. Some will fall by the wayside. Some will fall on stony soil. Some will fall on good soil. Some will fall amongst thorns and weeds. But the sower goes ahead to scatter the seed because there's a good chance that some will fall on good soil. Amen? Tell somebody, I am good soil. 
My heart is fertile ground for the word of God. Amen. Amen. And, and before we go further into the parable, can we take a look at the seed? I, I am amazed, flabberwhelmed, when I take a look at a seed. The first thing that I discover about a seed is it is almost indestructible. I mean, if I had a bean here and wanted to destroy it, stamping on it might not destroy it. I'd probably need a hammer to bang on it to destroy it. And I was meditating on what I was share this morning, just meditating and asking God for some insight. And I felt it would have been nice to do something that we did in primary school, I think it was primary school, when we took a bean and put it in a jar with some blotting paper, okay, and a little bit of water. Now this bean would have remained just like that almost indefinitely. What's the expiry date of beans? I, I don't know, I guess that they would rot sooner or later, but it's long. And this being senses that it's in the right environment. And Jesus said, except the seed of corn first dies, it abideth alone. This bean has abided alone for a long, long time and now it senses that the environment is just right for it to bring forth life. And that life comes first by dying. You see, we didn't get life until Jesus died. Amen? First by dying and then coming to life. So I, I thought maybe I should have put a seed in a jar so that you can see the different stages of its growth. When I first did it as a child, it was amazing that this thing that they said is dead has come to life. And I want you to understand this. God may have spoken a word to you. It may have come by way of prophecy. It may have come through the intimacy of just spending time with him in prayer. It could have come anyway. He may have spoken a word to you. It is not dead. It may seem dead to all accounts and purposes, but it is not dead. If he said it, It'll come to pass. I look at that little shoot in the jar and I wonder how all of this came from that. You just can't imagine if you were to try and compress the little shoot that goes down and the little shoot that goes up back into the seed, you would need at least 10 times the size of the seed to get it back in. That tells me something. Oh, how powerful the word of God is. Can't compress it. When it comes forth, it comes with power. And then this seed keeps going. Why? Because all the nutrition it needed to start up is there inside the seed. It is for the first part of its life self-sustaining. That's why the seed can fall in stony ground and still produce a shoot. It's self-sustaining. Brothers and sisters, 
The word of God comes with power in itself. And it will sustain until it is met with faith that gives it the, the nutrient to bring to pass whatsoever God has said. Jesus told the disciples in this parable, I spoke a parable to them because they don't understand seeing or having eyes they see not ears they hear not their understanding is dull but I'm speaking to you because you understand you guys have been with me he said the seed is like the word I don't know if you have a word from God for you you've received it you've internalized it and you're still waiting the season of your waiting for the performance of the word of God in your life has come to an immediate end God will surely perform it what soil are we giving him it can germinate anywhere but will it stay growing that's the key that is the word of God is a long haul word can't receive it now rejoice on it now you've got to stay the course hello and that's where many of us drop out amen I was just looking at the statistics of people dropping out of master life stay the course stay the course do not drop out because at the end of the day it's about who has the perseverance who will keep on going to that judge and saying give me justice amen Let's go back to that scripture. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And I said, I can't go through the whole of this passage. It's very long. In verse 19, he says, When one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart that is he which received by the wayside just imagine a lot of people going down the road you will always find some on the wayside amen there's some that aren't happy with the way, so they choose the wayside. He says, the wayside is likened to those who do not understand. The first thing I want to point out is that we cannot understand the word of God by our intellect. We can't understand the word trying to reason it out. Because God has declared that with him, the best of our wisdom is but foolishness. Amen? We can't understand the God, word of God by reasoning it out. We do anyway have a need for our intellect so i'm not saying throw your intellect away i'm not saying you cannot follow god if you don't have an intellect if you don't have an intellect you will end up on the wayside 
However, if we will understand the word, there is only one way, and that is to depend on the Holy Spirit to enlighten our understanding. Are you with me? But it's easy to say that. But how many of us actually depend on the Holy Spirit? The point is that the Holy Spirit is not a ghost or a mist. The Holy Spirit is a person, no less a person than Jesus Christ or the Father. He is a person. And so, even though we cannot see him, we can still relate to him as a person. I remember in my early days as a Christian, I read a book written by Benny Hinn called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And it really was dealing with developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That by the time you wake up in the morning and the first person you greet is the Holy Spirit, then you have, you have a relationship. We need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 18 says, having the understanding darkened. See, this, the devil has an interest in darkening our understanding. And he has so many subtle ways that you won't even know it's him. To darken our understanding. To prevent us from coming to the knowledge of truth. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Ignorance. Also can allow our spirits to be darkened. Psalm 32 verse 9 says, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in the bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee and bite thee. Don't be like the horse. Strive to understand. And I have many scriptures. I cannot go through them all. Um, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 5 says, Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Counsel in the heart of a man. Who's in the heart of a man who's a child of God? The Holy Spirit. He gives us counsel and understanding will come if we learn to relate to him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, you're probably very familiar with this scripture. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Without understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit, we are unable to even begin to know and to understand what our hope is. Amen. Let me go to the stony soil. He said, some fell on stony soil. I mean, when you look at a driveway that is made of gravel, if you see green, it is more than likely weeds because they are hardy, they are tough, amen? They can grow there. But a plant will have difficulty. And, and Jesus said that the people that hear the word they receive it with joy they rejoice at the word hallelujah I receive it but they have little depth little maturity in the things of God 
after a season because the roots have nothing to, to establish themselves in the plant dies they fail to continue to stand in the word <laughs> we're doing everything we can we stopped midweek services so that we could help bring the saints to maturity by submitting ourselves to the, our discipleship program it will mature you and give you greater understanding and insight the fact is that if you were to come here on a Wednesday you will find that about 70% that come from other churches so is it not about 70% come from Master Life from other ministries. 80. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and not everybody here has done it. Okay. Now I'm not saying this just so that, you know, we want to see you on Wednesday. But I realize how important it is for the saints to mature. Only mature saints can transform the world we need to have a depth because the stuff we're going to face okay the stuff we're going to face that will need for us to draw on our maturity on our on the depth of our roots in God At the first hint of persecution, that which was which fell on stony ground disappears. You know, they often say the church in northern Nigeria is much more hardy than the church in the south. Because the church in the north has been through it. They could wake up one morning and, and people just come and burn down their building. And governments don't help them to rebuild. Sometimes it takes adversity to wake us up. Amen? But that's not the message I've come to preach today. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now, superfluity of naughtiness, I don't understand that English. But I'll leave that for now. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls I think all I've been trying to do last Sunday and today is to show you how important it is to have the word of God and I can say today that as you walk in your Christian life you won't make it without the word we need to know the word of God we need to understand it and then we need to allow it to live in us it's a live word just like that seed looks dead because you see no movement when it gets into the right place life comes forth hallelujah paul said to, to timothy in his second epistle chapter 2 and verse 15 second timothy 2 15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's important. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Hallelujah. Some of the seed fell on thorny soil or fell amongst thorns. The soil was good, 
but it was also being used by thorns. Weeds can choke out the life in a plant. In the same way, the cares of this world can choke out the life of the word of God in us. If we submit to the cares, what will I eat? What will I wear? Where will I live? What will I drive? All these are cares. We must never allow the cares of this world to take the place of the word of God. And I, and I say this with a full understanding that we will pass through stuff. The challenges are depth in Christ Jesus. We will pass through stuff that will call into question the word of God. But the thing is, as we stand on the word of God, we will pass through and come out on the other side. Amen? And the word of God is the only assurance that we will get to the other side. All that we can stand on. Look at Peter. He said to Jesus, if it be you, Jesus, bid me come. In other words, give me a word. And Jesus gave him a word, come. And he started to walk on water. Amen. But he couldn't stay walking on water because he began to care about his safety. He looked at the waves and he said, wow, what if this wave washed over me? What if I drowned? Then he began to sink. But as long as he was fueled by the word of God and not his cares, he walked. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. And, and remember this, that the chapters and verses we have in scripture were put there by men. Okay? We demarcated the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12 is a continuation of the theme that he started in Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the, the Hall of Faith. Because it is in that chapter that the Bible recounts the testimony of those who live by faith. And note this, faith comes only by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith is a direct result of having the word of God engrafted in your heart. So 12 continues with the theme of faith. And he says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who is the cloud of witnesses? The saints that the Bible had talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The cares of this world. Let me say this, because there's a lot of stuff out there. And the cares of this world, sin, can lead you to a place where you turn your back on the Savior, on the King, on the Lord of glory. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, that it is impossible for one who has come so deep with God, you become so intimate with God, that if you turn away, it is impossible to again bring you unto repentance if we do not allow the cares of this world if we cannot bring them to the feet of Jesus he said cast your burdens at my feet and I will give you my rest my rest is not 
My rest is the confidence I have that because he's got them, I don't need to carry them anymore. He'll take care of me. He'll take care of them. Hallelujah. So the seed that falls on thorny ground is the cares. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and choke out the word of God. Somebody said, you know, if you really want to know what a man's character, and that includes a woman as well, of course, what a man's character really is like, wait until they have more money that they can spend. Then you will know what they are really like. On the, if they're respectful when they're poor <laughs> and they get rich, if, they, if they're really respectful, they will stay respectful when they're rich as well. Amen. Let's go to the good soil. Good soil is receptive soil. Good soil is like blotting paper. Pour water on it, it soaks it up. Good soil wants to hear. There's a desire for the word. You want his word in your life. Hallelujah. You seek his word. You know, some people just wait. Let me go to church. Let me sit down. Perhaps a word will come. You should prod the word. Amen. You keep on prodding. And as you prod, the Holy Ghost begins to inspire more. <laughs> that's why you go to some churches and say, preach on, preacher. And, and when they say that, and you know, that's not a guiding light assembly thing. Okay? Um, we just like to sit down and, and sometimes if some preachers come here and they look at our faces, they won't be able to preach. <laughs> but I'm used to you guys. Amen. I like you the way you are. Amen. <laughs> but sometimes just, 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 you know, pushing the minister, say, preach on, preach on. We need to hear this stuff. It brings more stuff. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Good soil nourishes the seed it gives the seed the nutrients that it needs to grow for the word of God what is the nutrient that we need for the word of God to grow in our heart number one what did I share with you last week I said we need to hear the word, the seed is sown, so you've heard the word. Believe the word. And then speak the word. You cannot speak the word until you have believed it. And it is your faith that makes you speak what you have believed. You hear, you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth. You speak that which you have believed in your heart out of your mouth and it will bring, bring results. Amen. So good soil is receptive. It nourishes the word and it promotes its growth. We have a few women here with little babies, yeah? A mother will not have a baby and leave the baby crying because she wants to watch, what do you watch? Amy? You know what Amy is? Africa Magic Yoruba. I got that one. You want to watch some, so baby's crying and mommy is busy watching Amy. 
No. As soon as the baby begins to cry, she drops Amy and goes, picks the baby up and feeds the baby because her number one mission in life while that baby is is to see that the baby is nourished so she's going to feed the baby good soil is a believer's heart a heart you know we call God kabiosi I love that Yoruba phrase because it, it sums up the, the meaning. It says, to ask is not an option. He is sovereign. A believer's heart only questions what you don't understand. A believer's heart is receptive and is able to receive what God has said without question. So if God said, when service is over today, get into your car and begin to drive to Kaduna and you know it is God, you won't ask him, why are you sending me to Kaduna? Okay? Because he is God and you believe him. And you believe that he always has only your best interests at heart. Amen. Sometimes the route to the best will take us through some tests and trials. As a matter of fact, let me be careful and say most times, if not every time. The seed has to die before it can grow. A believer's heart is an obedient heart. You know, the story of Saul, the king of Israel. Saul, not, not Saul that changed to Paul. He was so dependent on the adulation of the people that when he had conquered the Amalekites, he forgot or he decided not to obey the word of God that said, kill all of them kill all their animals, every single one. Because the people said, ah, these cows are fatu, oga, we feed your palm now. As soon as he did it, Samson, Samuel showed up and said, so, didn't you do what you were told to do? And so I said, yeah, God, I did it. He said, but I can hear some sheep bleating. Which sheep are these? Ah, we kept the best ones to make a sacrifice to God. Okay. And he told him, he said, oh God, obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. So a believer's heart is an obedient heart. It is a committed heart. Heart. That's good soil. Somebody who is committed to God. See, the truth is, most people are committed to themselves. Because if there was a contest between your commitment to yourself and the commitment, your commitment to God, guess who will win? Commitment to self. And the thing is this. When we are committed to God, very often the, the truth is that we are committed to God because of what we want. We're committed to God because of our self-commitment. But God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, their first commitment is his worship, not themselves. 